The Modern Jeeper Show, the show about Jeeps, Jeeping, and Jeepers. Well, hey, Modern Jeepers, this is another episode of The Modern Jeeper Show with me, Matt from Moto Cloak, and Mr. Modern Jeeper, Corey Osborne. Hey, buddy. Hey, hey, Rockstar Jeep Girl Jesse. What's going on, Madsen? Uh, you know what? I'm just sitting here in boring old office, hanging out in boring old uh, Metal Cook land, but you guys are on the road. Where are you at? We are in Dalhart, Texas at the moment, um, working our way towards uh, OKC for a CTI event tomorrow. And of course, eventually going to get down to uh, Jeep Beach. But uh, yeah, it's been a mad, mad couple last three days of you know not much sleep sinus issues wind driving all the things all the things yes well i was kind of hoping when you said you'd be on the road that you'd find an arby's parking lot because then it'd be kind of like retro back in the day right we we actually we we went through raton and uh we still had about two and a half hours before the uh the podcast was going to start so you know i i was sweat i almost thought we could make it to our destination tonight but before the podcast but the wind is just kicking our butts so um yeah we're at a loves parking lot in uh in the middle of texas nice loves well you know they're good people there always feel like walking to a loves and they greet you right and they give you a nice little customer service and Uh i was like we're we're on our way back from from uh, moab and you know you hear the thing with the fence you know attention attention um so and so and so and so please do courtesy checks of bathrooms and restrooms right they're doing that every hour the hourly courtesy check you know, make sure you don't have uh, toilet paper sticking to your shoes as you come walking out, going squeak, squeak, squeak. Mm, no, 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 no. <laughs> I've only no. done that once in my life. What? Use the public restroom? <laughs> well, no. You got, <laughs> I had paper had toilet paper and walked awesome. around the restaurant. Yeah, it was awesome. Well, it's better than the uh, the normal meme of the toilet paper stuck in, you know, a, a back behind in the pantyhose sticking out below the mouse. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, guys don't have to worry about that. <sighs> Ours just gets stuck. <laughs> well, we literally got home from Moab, had maintenance to do on the trailer, on the truck, on the Jeep, repacked the truck entirely, reloaded everything, repacked the Jeep, had to clean everything, do laundry, um, yeah, and and you know this whole sinus thing. I don't know if it's the wind or allergies or what, but both and it's, all the uh, Moab dust, the Moab know. dirt. I think I'm still blowing Moab red dirt out of my nose. So, mm. <clears throat> yeah, I think I'm still cleaning them out of the air canals. Mm-hmm, for Any sure, big vacuums that suck, maybe that's why suck I can't it off. Very well, she's got that's full of red dirt. Yeah, red dirt. You're full of red dirt. You're a red dirt girl. I wanted to take blood. some home, so I just crammed it in there. So, so while Moab, you know, we'll talk a little bit about our guests with our guests as well, but, uh, Moab was, was, it was interesting this year. I think it was, I think it was light, uh, as for attendance. I know the vendor show itself was very light. Um, it was good seeing a lot of great people though. Lots of good things happening. Lots of little rumors out there about companies and stuff like that. And, and good people to see and good parties. And I think it was great being out there. If you get rid of the six inches of snow that we had to deal with on Tuesday morning and the, uh, 25 degree weather and i was trying to do set up on wednesday morning but you know that's moab that's what it's all about yeah i think you know maybe it helped keep some of the dust out for a couple of days but by the end of the week thursday and friday it was warm and and breezy and uh yeah we forgot all about that cold weather yeah, yeah. but that's the craziness of moab right you can, and in, sing, in a single day you have the snow and it's windy and snowy and all of a sudden it's like sunny and beautiful that's right just be on the trails so um now be prior to even us getting there how many trails did you guys go run on because bef- that was like a week before yeah it, we did we did it i don't know well, three or four three we, did, we did a handful we did some uh, exploring for some possible routes for modern jeeper adventures moab over memorial day weekend yes registration is uh, still open registration is still open we did uh we went out we ran cliffhanger with with warren um jesse took a small group up uh top of the world top of the world um yeah we 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 got some we got some wheeling time in um 
didn't break anything. Yeah, no breakage, no no carnage. Of course, you know, all we see now coming back, if you look at social media, the only thing that's popular is the people who flip over and, and roll. So, <laughs> right. More boring. Yeah. You want to be famous? <laughs> you got to flop your rig, you know. Yeah, do it for the gram. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe you too will be on Matt's off road recovery. <laughs> Oh lordy! Dude, yeah, dude. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was it was fun though. It was still still a great great week. We did what two hundred and sixty, two hundred almost two hundred and forty rigs. Two hundred forty rigs on the CTI in twenty six oh, hours. Twenty six hours. That's a long time. Oh yeah. I, I guys, I run these guys like saves. It was twenty six hours, nonstop. Go go right. go. So I so I went to the chiropractor yesterday, and he was like, "What did you do to yourself?" I was pretty messed up by the time I got back. <laughs> well, I, you know, all that squeaking I heard upstairs, you know, yeah. I don't know what you guys were doing upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing I to do think, with the CTI next trailer. Year, next year, we're just going to go out for one day and we'll just do it. We'll just run for 26 hours straight. And, and then, then that's it. Home. The 24 hours of CTI. Right. It's like a Levon's thing. That means everybody has to be involved. So every hour we switch off. Yeah, you just keep going. Like 24 hours. Yeah, that's right. Like like it like you would change. Change drivers Marathon. in a race car. We do 24 go. hours of CTI. See yep. what's going on. Yeah, that's right. And we like we have to hit a goal. We have it's a oh, fundraiser. God, and it, every it's a fundraiser to be a part of it, which means if people you get go. scheduled, you got guys showing up at two o'clock in the morning, freezing cold Moab going on the CTI trailer. Yes, I like which it. means maybe we maybe our guests can help us like do a big thing. We'll do cameras and and uh, and and lights and you know. Have the whole area lit up and yeah lots of drinking though i'm sure there's gonna be lots of drinking you mean to to hydrate of course yes yes of course that's what i meant of course yeah yeah hot chocolate uh-huh stay warm <laughs> so okay go. where are you guys going now we are we're headed to um um oklahoma city more oklahoma yeah more oklahoma tomorrow we've got tri-city customs cti stop tomorrow um, another CTI stop um, in Tennessee, and then we'll start working our way south and see where we get to down in Florida. Nice, nice. And then, uh, so what day do you plan on arriving in Florida? Well, our our uh, the place that we're staying starts on Sunday, so we have to be there by Sunday. Nice. Now, we're going to be out there. You have Jeep Beach, of course. The show itself is what, Friday and Saturday or Thursday, Friday and Saturday? Well, you know, it kind of the events kind of start Tuesday. Yeah, but the main show. Main show, I believe, is Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. so Friday and Saturday, guys, we have three hundred shirts we're shipping out there. So they just arrived today, and so we'll have three hundred shirts we're shipping out, and uh, they're going to be, I believe, we like they're orange. I think we did orange. There's, there's something. Oh, that's and right. I, yeah. There, there, there's a, there's a little bit of a kind of an orange theme going on at Jeep beach this year for uh support of some young, young man, I believe. Yeah. Who's got, yeah. And I don't, I don't know the details. I'll try to share the details out with everybody, but I was asked to make orange shirts. So we have 300 orange shirts out there, nice. which is pretty cool. Cause you know, orange is my favorite color. Not that anybody would really know that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny when you, everybody mentioned orange and how quickly those took place or how those quickly got made. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what are you trying to say? Nothing. <laughs> oh, another gray shirt. Yeah. We'll get to those later. <laughs> well, you know, it's like you can be safe or you can be crazy. Now, hey, listen, Jeep Beach is the one where I've, I have jumped ahead. Like we did the baby blue shirts last year, right? Yes. Right. I, I'm willing to do pink. I'm willing to do pink. I think oh, the, we, we, huh? We'll do purple. purple sometime too, but you know, we got to do the pink. I look better in pink than I do purple. Hot Sorry, pink. Wrong. It's got to be hot pink. Regular now, pink is. Okay. Okay. So I had a hot pink like crop top, top when I used to water ski. Right. It was like crop top. Like, yes. It was like right there, hot pink. Right. You know, there with some hot pink uh, shorts. Yeah. It was like. Bring it back. I was all, Bring- I was all into the eighties. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And looked really good when I, I skipped over. The, it looked top. really, really good when I was going fast and I was tumbling through the water. You see the hot pink bobbing, bubbling upside down as my butt stick in the air. Interesting uh, <laughs> image in my mind. Okay. Happy to share. Happy to share. Okay, so we've got Jeepish coming up. So you got so much going on. Listen, 
Um, probably good to just, since you guys are out hanging out there, sweating out, we're just going to jump in to our guest because, uh, for all of our friends out there, we've been trying to get this guy on for a while. Um, he Talk is about a busy guy. He's a busy guy. I mean, I was watching him. I was watching him like work through a schedule. This guy is like a master of time management because he's got like, I think it was, he was scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And that was just like one day. You know, before right. I had to like get into the second day. And that was just the business schedule. Like, wait, now I got to check and cross-reference with my home personal schedule and I'll make it work in. I mean, it's I swear, it's like been been forever since we started talking about this and we finally got him in, which is why, even though you guys are sitting in a hot, sweaty uh, truck in the middle of no place, I wanted to get him in, get him in, capture him, have him a part of this, this group. So, hey, Sean Holman, welcome to the show. What's up, everybody? Yeah, it's uh, been crazy. I think I've been uh, traveling like uh, for the last six weeks, and I still got a, a few weeks to go. My, uh, I got back to Moab. My wife went on a week-long work trip, so uh, she tagged me in. I tagged her out, and um, in the middle of uh, being a single dad this week, and um, definitely missing Moab, for sure. That was, a, that was a great trip. It was. It was. Good to see you a few times in passing it's like what happens everywhere i think you know what was we discovered if you stand in one location in moab everybody passes you by at least once yeah at least once and be able to run into people in the parties and the parties were pretty good especially that mile star party that was fun yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah. great to see everybody out there i think the uh the biggest thing was you were saying it was a little bit light it kind of reminds me of moab of like 10 years ago or yeah. maybe eight years ago where you could actually get around and see everybody it wasn't uh so crazy that you just couldn't move, so it was great because you got to see everybody, but you could also get from place to place and get on uh, some really good, great trails without them being too crowded. So it was a I thought it was a really good year. So it was like ten years ago, minus the um, the inflationary uh, hotel yeah. fees, right? Yeah, like, hotel. Ten houses. years ago with a giant hotel in front of you. Yeah, no, it's Moab's definitely uh, definitely changed. I, I will say though, uh, you know, ten years ago when all the buggies were out there, law enforcement was hardcore. I mean, you probably see. 10 of your friends pulled over every day as you cruise down the main drag. I think I saw one person pulled over all week and they just didn't have the police presence that they had in the past, which tells me that they weren't expecting a lot of, a lot of rowdiness or trouble. And, and the buggies are pretty much gone from Moab. Now it's the UTVs, uh, but the Jeepers are the things that uh, have stayed constant. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those crazy things. I, um, a little bit, my probably my biggest disappointment about Moab is how chewed up everything is now. And if you go... Yes some of my favorite trails like uh, cane creek where you go to like hamburger hill where it used to be challenging you actually have to winch up on 37s now i mean there's all yeah. those places where 37s almost aren't big enough uh, top of the world's another one that's completely chewed up where on 37s you're going man i it's it's i don't know if it's the big tires and, and what and uh but i've always been a you know 37 max guy because i like to pick and choose my lines and my trails and and you know all that it's almost so challenging that you're you're worried about you know tie rods again and things like that as if we we're out on 33s back in the uh, 2000s it's, it's crazy how chewed up everything is mm -hmm. and is that just from more and more of these utvs trying to do things is it more and more of this guys with big tires out there doing yeah, what's, what's really both. causing all the destruction i think it's utvs obviously there's a lot of uh, erosion and rocks have been thrown out from tire spinning but a lot of these guys with the big horsepower engine swaps and things like that on 40s and 42s, um, it's 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 great, you, you know, point and shoot, have fun, whatever, you know, to each his own. Um, but to me, that's not a fun kind of wheeling. And I watch a lot of these guys trying to go to obstacles, and you know, they're having a good time, they put on a good show, but it just it just tears up the trails. I looked at some of the people with the Jeep rentals or with stalkers, and I was just going, man, I don't know how you would even do that, even on like. A, Poison Spider Mesa to take a stock trail or stock a, a Wrangler over the whole thing is you're working. It's an all day affair to, to get out of there without any body damage or, you know, and you're on your skids, you're on your rock sliders, all that kind of stuff. It was, it was pretty crazy. It's a little bit, a little bit bittersweet, a little bit sad because we could get on a lot of trails, but they were definitely more giant Jeep gobbling holes than, than I have ever seen in the 20 years I've been doing. Well, the trails are getting wider and wider and wider because People after are trying everybody's to chewed them up, then yeah. the UTVs yeah. are going to make their own trails. Yeah. Well, and not to mention the rigs are getting wider and wider and wider. And no right? one uses their lockers. No one uses their lockers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, that's a, kind of a funny uh, uh, lockers. endemic that you, you recognize when you're there. You're kind of like, hey, I can't tell you. I must have been maybe 20 times where somebody said, Hey, is your locker on? Like people didn't even realize they hadn't turned on the front lockers 
and they're just they're just doing burnouts with their tires and everything. It's like, hey, front locker. You know, I think one of those had a broken front locker, so it's like, oh, it's on, but it's not engaging. Okay, that happens to all of us. But there are so many people who I don't know if it's the the big lifts and big tires where they just forget kind of the basics, and you go, oh, it's, I'm so I'm in such a point and shoot rig, I don't even think about it anymore. For me, I'm always thinking about you know what situation I'm in in terms of, you know, my lockers on, on front and rear sway bar, all that kind of stuff. And always thinking about what gear and what line I'm going to take. And there's a lot of people who are just, I guess it's just, you're so capable at that point. They're just driving through the trail and totally forget that they have those extra things that they can use to get up and over things easily. And I think a lot of times, again, you talked about, you know, roll on the gram uh, to get famous. I think there's a lot of people who want to put on a show, but I don't know that that's, that's always uh, super awesome. Well, they forget, people forget that, um, I mean, it's been interesting in, in the last 22 years, like you brought up, there's, there's this gap. And I think that the people that are buying a rig now, it may be their first Jeep, but it was, you know, there's, they spent $80,000 on this thing and they, there's not a whole lot of skill that got sold when they bought the Jeep. So it wasn't yeah. like they acquired the skill to drive it. So then you get out there and it's on forties already and it's their yeah. first Again, it just it just kills me. Um, there's more UTV and side by side rentals in Moab than there's ever been in the past. Um, I talked to some Red Rock guys, and they actually sold out. They sold out all their trails, but it was weird. Like you said, I, I think we saw more side by sides and UTVs in town um, a couple of days before Easter Jeep Safari started. We didn't see any Jeeps on the trails. It was just side by sides, yeah. and they're irresponsible. Hey. Almost hit one coming around a corner because he was bombing. Yeah. Oh, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, and I don't want this to be a disparage big guy, you know, guys with big right. tire stuff because there's a lot of guys who built their own rigs who have grown up through the ranks and they are incredible drivers on, uh, on those machines. But um, funny, uh, just a side note, uh, UTVs outnumbered Broncos by yeah. a lot. I, I think, you know, Ford had a big event where there might have been 50 Broncos. But if I counted on my hands of all the ones that were privately owned that didn't belong to a company, maybe 15 in town. I, I thought this was going to be the big Bronco invasion to show off, you know, how capable they are in the Wrangler crowd. And they're just people didn't bite like it was all Jeeps all the time, which was actually pretty interesting to see. Because I remember when the FJ40 came or the FJ Cruiser came out, Toyota made a huge play when Hummer was out there. Hummer made a huge play, went out there um, and there just were hardly any Broncos. So I don't know if that's they're selling to a different crowd or if that's uh, the aftermarket wasn't ready yet for them because it's still early and it's people are waiting or if uh, it just hasn't gone to, you know, really disrupted the Jeep market the way they thought they would. I just thought that was interesting. Well, people can't drive them. Yeah. <laughs> There's well, that. Yeah, there are a few tie rod <laughs> issues out there. Well, right. well and it, it, it was interesting at the show because we decided to put Corey's, we put Golden Spike in the show as well as the jail. And most everybody else in the show has got something. They got a Gladiator, they got a JL, they got a Bronco, all these, that was and all all the show. And more people came by going, oh, wow, there's something I actually drive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's something I actually use. Like, here's the products we actually use. Um, you're going back to the cops. That was interesting you mentioned that because I saw a, a string of guys leaving town that were getting pulled over. I guess there's a particular um, Mountie out there that the mud, uh, the mud flap the mud. guy, the mud oh, flap yeah. guy. I saw a few posts on uh, on Instagram and uh, Facebook where my friends uh, said they were getting parting gifts uh, from the town of Moab on the way out. Now, my Jeep is a you know AV uh, factory build and it's got rear mud flaps and I take heat all the time from people. Oh, you got the mud flaps on there. You know what? I don't crack people's windshields. And I don't get bothered by the police. Those are two things that uh, I'm totally fine with. So, right. have, yeah, you know what? My Jeep has mud flaps. What you know? What you Guess doing? what? Is I it, didn't have any problems leaving town. Hey, has it ever stopped you wheeling? Not once. No, you, you ever caught that on a you know nope. Pritchett or you know I've, ever I've like driven yeah. over the back of it, backing up on an obstacle? They just pop back into place. No mm. big deal. Amazing how that works. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I it's it's just like again it's like when I you know I prefer not having them, but my Jeep came with them and I didn't care enough to take them off and. Been, I've, I've got 28,000 miles on this one with probably 10,000 miles of it off being off road. It's never bothered me once. So, so speaking of which, obviously, this is uh, Jeeps, Jeepy, and Jeepers. This is modern Jeeper. Um, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about your history and who you are because they may not know the name Sean Holman, although you are famous in some circles, infamous in others. <laughs> I don't know um, so, I'm going to read a little bit of your bio here because it says Sean sure. Holman is a longtime automotive enthusiast. 
obvious, and journalist who has been with 10, the Enthusiast Network, since 2003, holding editorial staff positions at Truckin, Truckin's SUV, Four Wheeler, eventually taking on the editor position at 4x4 Garage and Diesel Power. In addition, Sean's work has appeared in many other brands, including JP, Recoil, Hot Rod Bikes, and Hot Bike. Hot Bike, wow, you're into bikes? Uh, yeah, I used to ride. I used to ride. I had a. Uh, I started with a uh, 2004 Sportster that we 883 that we pulled apart, turned into a, a 1250 Stage Three with Nolan Racing parts, and oh, did wow. about 100 to the rear wheels. And I uh, used to go out and terrorize uh, people and turn that into a cafe racer. And wow. uh, blew the engine up once on the dyno when the uh, keyway on the oil pump gear sheared, and it was the most dr- anticlimactic engine blow ever. It went on the dyno. It was, <laughs> <laughs> we all looked at each other like, what was that? Yeah. Big puff of uh, fuel uh, came out of the Makuni uh, 42 carb, and uh, then the starter wouldn't engage anything. We realized we took out all the valves and the pistons and all that, but um, I uh, put uh, 1200S uh, suspension on it, real and mid-sets and clip-ons, and turned into a cafe bike, and it was a lot of fun. I realized I didn't have enough suspension or brakes, so I went out and bought a uh, Buell City Cross. So I had an XB9 which I absolutely loved. It was my favorite bike I've ever owned. It was like a tractor. It had the exact same power band as my Ranger did at the time. And uh, it was great for, uh, you know, it wasn't fast, but man, it would handled great. So I'd go up in Angeles Crest and places like that and just do the pace. And just leave in third gear and never have to shift because there's so much torque in that thing. And it was a blast. I just had, had fun. I used to joke that my uh, motorcycle, that my street bike had uh, handlebars and my uh, cruiser had clip-ons and rear sets. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to I used to ride. I haven't ridden in a long time. Uh, riding a motorcycle in LA will challenge you when you become a dad and you realize, you know what? I I I've got kids back at home. So yeah. yeah, when I was living in LA when I was a kid, I grew up with uh, a bunch of bikers, my mom's friends, and they were, you know, they were all like into this. There was a misfit group, right? No, everyone had a uh, Honda V Twin, you know, Harley's, all kinds of stuff, right? And they all at one point, this was early 80s, they all got decided to buy the Honda, it was at the um, Interceptor when it first came out. Honda Interceptor, V4-5 Interceptor, right? They all picked those up, five of them, they had matching Interceptors. Three of them laid them down in like the first two weeks. And just the whole idea of riding in LA, just it it scared me since that point. I couldn't do it. I like riding out here when I got open, you know. I, yeah, I lived hang. somewhere, you know, where it wasn't so crowded. Nobody in cars are looking for you, and it just it just became a liability. So yeah, yeah. So what well, I, I think the reason I kind of pointed that as well is like you're the real deal, man. You're not like some guy who, hey, this is kind of cool. I can write about Jeeps. I mean, you you are you live and breathe and eat the the what you're writing about. You live and eat and breathe the trucks, the jeeping life, the uh, the gear headedness of it. I, I love it all. I mean, uh, you know, I've got a 67 F100. We're uh, trying to get finished up, and I've got a 1942 Ford GPW that hopefully will get out to Moab next year. It was the uh, first 4x4 I ever drove. I've got my 20 JL. I've had a few JKs before that. I've had a long travel pre-runner Ranger four-wheel drive that I used to chase in Baja. I raced in the Baja 1000 with the Halls. I mean, just I've, I've you know, recently went on a, uh, a trophy truck ride along with Ryan Arciero and his uh, Herb Miller or Herb Smith uh, trophy truck, and uh, I mean, it's just I'm all about whatever whatever interesting opportunities are out there that involve the automobile. I've I've literally been driving in the uh, the Sahara Desert with camels on a trip. I've I've been to Europe, and this job has taken me to you know four of the seven continents, and I've had a lot of great experiences and. Um, at the end of the day, I, you know, I love anything automotive. I don't care. There's a lot of people who don't want to see electrics come. Um, I don't care. I'm all about everything. I, you know, steam powered was way cool. I've ridden in Jay Leno's Stanley steamer, uh, before. Oh, wow. And that was every bit as cool as the diesels that I used to write about in diesel power, love internal combustion engines and super curious about the electricity and not from the saving the world standpoint. I think that's all pretty much BS. I'm interested about it from the uh, enthusiast standpoint, how it can deliver so much power. Um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of interesting questions I have about the future of the hobbyist with, uh, with an electric drivetrain. So to me, it's like, if it, if it goes like hell and, uh, it's fun, I, I don't care if it has two wheels, three wheels, four wheels, six wheels, whatever, let's get out there and go have, have a good time. Nice. That's awesome. So how did you get started over 
at uh well at the, that time it was you call it the enthusiastic network now but i mean yeah. what was it what was the original name when you started over there yeah so now it's actually motor trend group so we've right. always had motor trend as part of the family of uh, brand but when they got bought by you know discovery as our majority uh partner a few years back they they moved it because velocity got renamed motor trend channel and they wanted everything to be kind of um you know along the in the in the motor trend you know branding but when I started, it was the very end of what was called um, EMAP into the Prime Media days. So it's funny, we used to joke that, and it was a legacy, was General Media and Peterson Publishing. So we used to joke that the way to, to remember the company is Pepsi 10. So it was Peterson, EMAP, Prime Media, Source Interlink, and then 10, the Enthusiast Network. Now you had Discovery and Motor Trend on that. So I, I've been there 19 years. I've had like nine owners i've seen it all i've lived it all i'm like the automotive journalist equivalent of cockroach or twinkie and uh <laughs> i have still you know, i still love what i do i basically run all the truck and off-road stuff on the aftermarket as far as content goes for for motor trend but um i'm lucky to to love what i do to, to be able to do it every day I have a lot of experiences but you would ask you know how i got started it's um when i was a kid i, I read i think i had subscriptions of 13 different car magazines so automobile, car and driver, motor trend, you know, everything, auto week, uh, four wheeler, Pearson's four wheel and off road, all of them. And, um, I just read, read, read everything I could. And I loved every minute of it. And I remember the editor of car and driver at the time was Chubba Chubba. And he said that in a response to a reader who wanted to get an automotive journalism that it, you know, you should go get an engineering degree and the average person is, you know, you don't get paid much and the average person will never get into it. It was too hard. Don't even try was sort of the the well, I'm paraphrasing the answer. I never really thought about it, to be honest with you. I just loved doing that. Well, I had worked uh, at automotive repair shops. I did customer service, learned how to wrench, went to ROP, you know, did all that kind of stuff. And then uh, I, I got into, believe it or not, law enforcement. I got my degree in criminal justice, and I worked as a civilian for the local police department. Actually went to the police academy, graduated. I was eight out of 72 in my class. And then decided kind of not to uh, not to pursue that. Um, and along the way was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Well, I had a friend who I knew who needed somebody to help uh, do some writing uh, for his B2B publication and asked me if I was interested in working on uh, some story, you know, freelancing on the side. And at the time I was working at Boeing, uh, doing fire and security and just a super interesting time at Boeing. That's all like a whole other story. Um, when I was there it was during September 11th. Uh, we had to lock down our plant um, when the Columbia disaster happened. Um, I was one of the uh, first security officers we, in, in our plant in Huntington Beach. We had a mirror image of Houston's uh, mission control with the Florida ceiling consoles and screens and or rows of consoles and the screens. And we would support all the shuttle missions. Well, when Columbia happened, I had to go lock all the doors and call what's uh, referred to as a contingency and keep track of everybody coming and going on a logbook just to go to the bathroom because they didn't know if there had been sabotage or anything like that. So really crazy time in aerospace. I had a top secret clearance. So I had to go make sure that inside the vaults where these engineers would work, classified material was locked up. It wasn't left out and all that kind of stuff. Well, I worked graveyards, which allowed me to freelance write during the day. And so I was just grinding. I'd work at night. I'd write during the day, started getting more and more assignments. So Went on a couple of things, met a couple of people who were working for uh, Prime Media at the time, and uh, got myself in the door. And the first place I started was uh, Truckin' Magazine and kind of rose through the ranks of Truckin'. Back then, Truckin' was 450 pages a month. It was uh, just a massive, wow. it was a juggernaut. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was huge. We had 13 people on staff. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable. And uh, worked my way up to the road test editor there, and then I'd always wanted to get the off-road side and had an opportunity at Four Wheeler, and then jump ship over there to get back to what I really enjoyed doing. And, and I was off-roading. And during that time I had a, my first four by four was a 94 Ranger splash step side, four liter V six, four wheel drive, had sport bucket seats, black. It was cool. Uh, and my dad and I would go out and uh, go to different places in the desert and just check them out. We had a, a yearly man trip that we would do, which was super cool. And then I started, you know, uh, going out on my own, uh, with friends and figuring out cool places. And then I found sometime in the late nineties, the Mojave road guide by Dennis Casebeer, which if you live in Southern California is the Bible for sort of desert travel on the Mojave road. And really Dennis's uh, guide got me to a point where I realized that off-roading and history could go hand in hand and got me into like backcountry exploration and history. And that's where my love of sort of building for, 
you know, point to point camping and, and checking things out. That's sort of what became overlanding really uh, started back then. And then full circle. Now I'm on the board of directors at the MDHCA, which was Dennis's organization. Um, so it's really funny how life works out sometimes and sort of you can take these different paths and you get funneled back to maybe where you're supposed to be. So it's, it was, it's been a very circuitous route, but I've, I've been doing this uh, at Motor Trend for a little over 19 years and in the industry for 25 or so. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. I remember. So I think when I got into it 13 years ago, when we started this source and in, interlink was like the yep. name of the time, right? Yep. Source interlink. And then even then, I mean, back then, 13 years ago, the magazine still had a little bit of heft and then they started getting thinner yep. and thinner and thinner. And then they started disappearing. How, so, but I need to know with all these different vehicles and stuff you had, so how, where's your property? How big is it? Are you like payway with like, you know, 50 rigs that have to get moved around? No, no, I, I've got, uh, so I live in suburban Orange County, California in Huntington Beach. I've got a 6,000 square foot lot with a 2,400 square foot house and a three car garage. And uh, my old house was a single story ranch, had a little bit bigger property and I could park you know, on the side. I don't have that luxury here. When my wife and I bought this, she was looking to move and I said, hey, here's the neighborhood I'll move to. Here's where I'll, what I'll do, but I have to have a three car garage, really wanted a two story house. And I gave like all this ridiculous stuff that would never happen. And my parents were like, Hey, you guys still looking? And we're like, no, not really. And my wife's like, yes. My mom's like, Hey, here's this house in this neighborhood you want. It's a three car garage and a two story. And then it ended up being, you know, exactly what I said I would need to move. So we ended up buying it. But uh, no, I, I have uh, I have a uh, three car garage, two slots are filled with all sorts of everything. Uh, and uh, the other side of it is my uh, 42 GPW. And then in the driveway, my wife's got a Grand Cherokee. I've got whatever work vehicle I'm driving. Plus, I've got my uh, my um, uh, Wrangler out there. And then I am working on the 67 F100, which will hopefully come home later this year. We'll see if all the stars align. And then uh, I've got a 60 Volkswagen Beetle that I'm going to start building for my daughter. Uh, and it's funny because she said, hey, Dad, I'm going to help you clean out the single side of the uh, three-car garage. So I parked my my beetle in there and i just laughed at her and i go if you think that you're next in line for a garage spot before your step i'm crazy and she uh, basically was like okay. <laughs> so i'm like you can help me clean the garage but you're gonna get a really nice california car cover on top of uh, your beetle it's not going inside so but we're uh that thing uh is is pretty cool we're gonna throw a, a 1600 dual port in it and give her a nice yep. uh nice nice little ride around town so i got a buddy building me the 12 volt and a transaxle setup with the new main shaft for the old style suspension and overdrive and we're going to gear it so it's about 65 it's about three grand it's like all right this is your round town car you can't go on the freeway with it but the, the dirty secret is if i want to go on the freeway with it and take it to a car show i'll be able to do that so <laughs> anyway <laughs> she, she thinks that it's her car and it's so funny because she's like dad you know my beetle my beetle it's like all right here's the deal it's my beetle and you're going to earn it from me because nothing nothing's free in life but what i'm really going to do is when she goes off to college she's uh she can you know i'll buy it from her for her real car and we'll keep it in the family because it'll, it'll be pretty special when it's finished so uh but she's she's super old school vintage old soul so she's looking forward to driving her her beach beetle around and do a little nice. wire rack on top and and you know it'll be uh, that really cool gulf blue with uh wide whites on it we'll do the premium chrome package and oyster nice. interior here so it should be pretty cool nice you have to put the token surfboard on top yeah right exactly yeah we i found a uh, rack it just needs to be uh, cleaned up and dipped so hopefully uh we'll be able to do that and get some nice wood on it and, and it'll be a, a, a fun little round town car for her. that's so cool yeah cool daddy yeah it's uh sometimes i you know I, i'm like I, I just take on too much stuff but i just can't help myself i can't i i basically can't quit my projects or or you know say no to anybody which i guess is sort of why I've been successful is because I just keep saying, yeah, okay, I'll do it. I don't know how I make it all work, but try to try to squeeze it all in. Well, there's an old philosophy. You want to get something done, give it to the busy guy. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah the, the, the busy guy is running out of room now. Well, and then, you know, on top of that, we've got our podcast too. And which is like another, as you know, it's like a, a second full, full-time job. So it just, it gets, uh, you know, like I said, you saw me looking through my phone. I wait for my Apple watch to tell me where to go next. That's how I manage it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your podcast that's uh you're at what 220 something episodes now yeah i think if you add all the bonuses and stuff up yeah somewhere in the 230s now 
Wow. Wow. So, and so how long ago did that start? Is, your, is it like weekly? Yeah. So every Monday we started it four years ago. I just had our fourth anniversary, which is pretty crazy. Uh, was able to, uh, thanks. We were able to have uh, some pretty good uh, sponsors from the beginning who have kept it alive. And we uh, last uh, fall, we passed a million downloads. Um, so it's just been, it's, it sort of started as a, a pet project at work where they said, you know, we know prints declining. So come up with an idea of, uh, you know, how you can backfill some of that revenue and content. And I pitched it to them and they said, no. And I pitched it to them again. And they said, no. And I put a business plan together and said, this is really cheap for what you're getting. And they went, all right, well, you have a year to make money. I think within three months we made money and uh, the rest is history. So it was, uh, my, my friend, uh, Jay Tillis, who, if you ever grew, grew up in uh, LA, if you're familiar with K-Rock, he was lightning from K-Rock. So he's a big oh, wow. uh, car and truck guy. So I, I knew that I wasn't, uh, you know, I could bring some expertise and some Rolodex to the, to the show, but I need somebody else who was smarter than me for audio production and all that stuff. And so we, uh, we make a pretty good team with, in terms of, you know, uh, he's more into the street and lowered stuff and custom stuff. Uh, I like that too, but I'm also into the uh, more off-road and a lot of the OE stuff. We were able to kind of put a lot of content together. I think it's called the truck show podcast, but it's really about everything trucks and, and four by fours and lowered. And we, our taglines lifted, lowered and everything in between. And it really is what, what we do. There was no general interest podcast at the time that covered the entire truck market. There's like the diesel guys or the Chevy C10 guys or, the off-road guys or whatever, but there wasn't one that did everything. And so that was sort of the premise of the show is, is do it like a morning show. And we've had a, a ton of people who have circled back and said, man, I don't even listen to, you know, my morning show on the radio anymore. I listen to you guys when the show comes out and, um, you know, Matt's and you and I talked about this in Moab. It's pretty amazing how you touch people's lives. Um, audio is a really intimate format and you, you really kind of uh, get this, this really neat, uh, relationship with your listeners and we had a guy who emailed us and he said you know my my dad and i listened to your show and we had been fighting we hadn't talked in like 10 years and it stalled out over the c10 project that we fought over we ended up just not talking anymore he says your show brought us together and on every saturday we would get together listen to the show and we'll wrench on the c10 and he said uh, you know last month my dad died of cancer and if it weren't for the podcast and you guys getting us together, I never would have reconnected with my dad and had that time with him before he passed away. And so hearing stories like that where you just think you're two knuckleheads talking about trucks and having a good time, you don't realize that you're you're actually impacting people's lives in, in a positive way. So that kind of stuff is really cool to hear because it's just it's so much bigger than what you think it'll be when you start. I mean, this thing started on a napkin in a Norm's diner. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, we, we were talking about that and it's just, it, and Corey and Jesse experience it all the time when they're going cross country, right? Um, just, just people walking up and saying, Oh, I love your podcast. Love your podcast. Love your podcast. Right. And you just, it's uh, weird. People up when we're on, they're on the CTI trailer and they're like, you know, we've been, we've been listening to your podcast and we didn't even know what the trailer was. And we always, <laughs> we tend to put the trailer first, you know, we don't think of that. And it's funny that people would pick up something like the podcast and then, figure out who metal cloak was it's that kind of relationship you kind of go oh it's it's rewinding it for some people yeah, yeah uh, i've made some really really amazing people um some of my good friends now from people coming up or messaging me yeah about me. so i've got to feel like that too we were walking down the main drag in moab i brought my 14 year old with me this year and somebody walked by and said hey sean i said yeah he was like hey i really love the podcast my daughter's like dad you're famous i'm like <laughs> no, I'm not famous. Some guy listens to my podcast. That's about it. But I've had a lot of I've had a lot of great experiences with um, listeners as well. I've had uh, listeners uh, invite me out to Quantico. He's an FBI instructor on the range. He's anytime I want to make it out to Virginia, he'll take me on the range. I had another um, listener who uh, was third in command of a Ohio class uh, ballistic missile sub. And oh. uh, invited me out to Kings Bay, Georgia, and I went on a tour of the USS Tennessee in dry dock. Wow. Um, I can actually tell people that I have walked underneath an Ohio class nuclear submarine. And how many people get to say that, right? So, right. Um, got the full tour of everything but the reactor and the classified areas on it, all because of the podcast. And I gave those guys a ton of swag and, and stickers and shirts and all that stuff. And, um, you know, with the boomers, 
because they are not, they, you know, a typical Navy ship does ports of call. Well, the boomers are out hiding for three months underwater. They don't, what they bring is what they have. They're not going to cool places and getting off the submarine in the middle of their, you know, the deployment. So bringing podcasts and bringing that kind of stuff, magazines, that's all they have with them. So they really appreciated that and invited me out. And the commander of the base gave me one of their challenge coins and said, I oh, really appreciate your support of, uh, of the military and the U.S. Navy. And so I've got a uh, Kings Bay, Georgia submarine uh, dev group um, uh, coin from that's the commander awesome. of the base. Thank you. So, I mean, that's all podcast related, right? Like that's all that really cool stuff that uh, I've been able to do because of the podcast. So it's pretty neat. That's pretty awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. And, and again, the, the, the lives you touch and the people, the stories you tell are just part of that, that game that we like to play. You know, Corey, when, uh, when I first suggested doing this one with him and he tells the story better than I do, but it's like, he was like, what, what, you know, people are going to want to listen to us. You know, and it's, I, it's... I remember we, we had this whole melt. Uh, well, I had my own meltdown because I'm like, wait, okay. With everything else we're doing now, we have to come up with a script and what are we going to talk about? And we got to record this thing. And, and Matt was like, no, no, we're not going to script it. I'm like, well, then I'm not going to do it. Like, what do we, we just can't <laughs> talk. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just like our phone conversations started out as uh, it was like, Hey, we should be recording some of this stuff. So it's funny how things evolve for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I remember there was also the fact that our, we had all kinds of great information we were sharing on our, on our phone recordings and, and we were just on our phone calls and uh, realized that most of that stuff we couldn't actually say on a podcast because it was <laughs> right. unverified or confidential or so-and-so yeah. told me so-and-so. And it's like, yeah, I'd have to come up. I think what we should have done was I have a third character that would pop up in a, in just in a covered hood. Right. <laughs> I just, yeah. just, so the latest rumor is that so-and-so <laughs> yeah. said, you know, and that way we can like, have this person in our uh, rendition van and they're going to tell you everything they know. Exactly. Plausible <laughs> deniability. Yeah. So, so you've been doing that. So you, how the heck do you get through a day, man? I mean, between, between the podcast, between the writing, between the stuff you do, because what is your official title right now? Like, uh, my official title is content director of the truck and off-road group for motor trend group. For okay. the group. For the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's grown up from just being a little writer to being like the man in charge, nineteen hour. But that uh, that could also be the fact that he's the only guy who was who didn't leave. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> there's a few of us. Uh, Christian Hazel's still around, and yeah. uh, Ken it's funny. I would, so at Moab this year it was uh, Christian Hazel, Vern Simons, Ken Brubaker, uh, our newest guy Jared, who's been with us for like six years, and myself. And we took a, a group photo at the house because we all stayed together. I looked at it and I said, you know, if you added up all of our, just our writing experience, just us five had over like 85 years or something like that uh, wow. writing experience, which is pretty amazing. I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of knowledge and a lot of interesting stories, you know, over the, over the years that we've told. And um, the thing about the podcast that's been cool is in writing, there's not really an opportunity to tell some of those side stories that, you know, the podcast is so casual. There's been a lot of things I've been able to kind of get out that, that I haven't been able to tell in any other forum. So there's a lot of great side stories that we mix in and things like that, of just being a journalist over the years. So do you, do you on your podcast, I mean, there's, do you really get into deep dive stuff? Like really oh, yeah. take the time to go and explore? Do you have time limits or you just go until you're done? Yeah, they're mostly like two hours and we try to fit in like three or four segments. We have about 20 segments. So everyone features about four to five segments. We just mix them up so that it's not the same formula every time. And, We've had everything from a, a guy who made a widget in his garage trying to sell it on Amazon to uh, somebody who owns an event in the Southeast and there's a big truck show to uh, the head of car companies, chief engineers, uh, the guy who developed the uh, Blackhawk uh, E squared shocks on the Ram TRX, explaining the whole development process. And it's funny, you think with uh, audio, people wouldn't nerd out as much because you can't see. I'm a visual learner, so it's hard when somebody explains it. But man, some of our best episodes have been with people that have gone on a really technical deep dive and, and shared info that you just can't get anywhere else. You know, they're willing to kind of tell you the backstory. The other thing I think is great about it is, you know, it gives us the opportunity, especially when working with these big brands like Jeep, for example, and you have Jim Morrison uh, who runs Jeep North America on, it really humanizes the brand, you know, and, and people come in and they go, wow, you know, I, I can relate to that guy. He's a normal guy. He, he does the things that we do. And, and it makes this like corporate, you know, um, just entity 
feel like they're like you, right? You can relate to them. And so I think that's an, one of the things that we do really well is give people an opportunity to, to engage in a different way with the brands that they like and the people behind them. That's cool. That's cool. Now I let's mean, go back. Go ahead. We, I think our, one of our, one of my favorite episodes we ever did was with Steve Sasaki from power tank oh, yeah. and he in depth, you know, we weren't, I don't even think we were doing video then, mm-hmm. but, um, he went in depth talking about, you know, the gases and, and how gases work in a compressed cylinder and all of that. And, and I think people, like you said, it, it, it's like real people coming up with ideas and creating things that we all use, we take advantage of, and, and we just think of it as, you know, here's this power tank or here's with this widget. Yeah. Whatever here's a is. commodity that's in the industry, but you don't actually think of the guy who was the first one to right. Have it. Right. And, yeah, and that's a commodity. It's it's somebody's dream or somebody's life passion that we've all bought into in a way. When you hear that story, it's pretty awesome because everybody I think who hears it has a newfound respect, uh, both on the entrepreneurial level, but also for the brands as well. And I, I think again, it it shows like how it, it's not a stretch for people who are dreamers to make make it come true, whether it's an entrepreneurial spirit or wanting to build their Jeep or whatever the case is like it, you can do it. Other people are out there doing it. So it tends to be in, in, in my opinion, inspirational to hear these, these stories because you kind of realize you're not alone in your thoughts. Well, I I'll tell this, I I've told this story before, but um, one of the things that changed me into focusing on the off-road industry was ultimate adventure because I was such a fan boy. I was an enthusiast for, for years and years, but then all of a sudden putting a face uh, it's the first time I ever met uh, Vern yeah. and Clifton and Trent and to spend time with those guys and have read all of their stuff over all the years. It was just kind of like this, wait a minute, you know, these are funny. people involved here. They, they tell you don't meet your heroes, right? Because there's so many people have egos and things like that. And every one of those names that you just read off are some of the best people you could ever meet. The Hazel, yeah. the Vern Simons, the Trents of the world, Clifton, um, they're all top-notch people that they're exactly the people when you meet them and it's funny i think there's a thing about off-roading that's so different than let's say the custom truck scene as an example um love mini trucks love lower trucks custom truck stuff but there's something inherent in off-roading where you just don't have as many a-holes and i think the reason for that is if you blow a bag on the highway to have us do or whatever call triple a they're picking you up take it to a shop you get it fixed if you blow something on your jeep off road it could be a life or death situation so i think that that in there's something inherent to what we do we're more open kinder more generous people tend to gravitate toward and the attitudes team seem to be muted more because you never know that last guy you wave to on the trail might be the guy that saves your butt if you get yourself into some serious trouble and when i've seen people on the other side of the fence you get a lot a lot of egos not that our industry doesn't have it we've got that too but there's just something different about the majority of the people in our industry who are so personable and welcoming and, and ready to lend a hand. And most of our guys like to get dirty. They almost wish something broke on the trail. So they have something to do and they can show you, you know, with WD-40 bailing wire and a battery, what they can, uh, what they can fix yep. and get you home. So I just, think that's so much different than any other sport or hobby is, you know, a, a friend of mine, Chris Collard, who shoots a lot of Jeeps photography and is a explorer and, and a great journalist in his own right. Chris always says that uh, bad roads bring good people and good roads bring bad people. And I think that's <laughs> wow. super accurate and, and a little bit deep. <laughs> yeah. Chris was just on our last episode out oh, there yeah. at the uh, Easter Jeep Safari, checking out the, the, uh, all the, the, the rigs and Jeeps concept rigs coming out, which yep. by the way, how was that for you? What did you think of the concept rigs this year? Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, the concept rigs are something that we always want to look at. Um, it's if you have been paying attention, eyes wide open, go back five, eight years, look at those concepts and figure out how much was teased at what's out now. Mm-hmm. They are direct correlations between what you're seeing there and what actually makes it to the market in a couple of years. Um, you know, the, the Mopar concepts were the Mopar concepts, you know, their catalog builds, they're cool, whatever. I thought the QR code Gladiator was brilliant in terms of having something in a display. That's cool. But it's always the design concepts that that are the best. And this year was a little bit different. Um, in previous years, there's been some vintage stuff. There wasn't really anything vintage this year. 
Um, I thought that the 41 was cool. It was sort of a nod to the military past with a little bit of mod modernity, I guess is what they say. Um, but it was just, it was, it was okay. There's a, a few little teases on there. Um, Bob, which was the uh, bed short and gladiator. I don't know if anybody saw the key ring on that, but it was uh, Lorena Bobbitt. Yeah, Chris and, Collard sent us a photo. Yeah. So uh, that's pretty funny. Um, but uh, that thing was cool. Um, it was, you know, it's sort of like if Sandstorm was the race Jeep, then yeah. Bob was sort of the rock crawler version of that, right? A little bit more streetable, yep. a little bit more trail ready than the go fast, but they kind of complement each other. Um, I thought the 20th anniversary Rubicon was cool. There are 100% things that are on that Jeep that are coming next year to the 23 model. So just, uh, I won't say what those are, but a wink and a nod there. The um, 4xE Grand Cherokee was very cool. Um, in fact, just ordered one of those for my wife. Just got back from the Grand Cherokee drive. That thing, I, I can't believe how fast the Wrangler crowd and enthusiasts have embraced the 4xE Wrangler. It's the same drivetrain in the Grand Cherokee, and the new Grand is really incredibly capable, way more capable off-road than 99% of people will ever even come to appreciate. Um, and the 4xE is actually a second faster 0 to 60 than the V8 while getting 25 miles on all electricity, which is really cool. And I think with the plug-in hybrids, uh, Jeep's done something really cool where you can push a button and there's three modes. There's battery only uh, until the battery's gone. There's e-save where you can decide to save your e uh, your battery for whenever you want to use it. So if you want to drive to the Rubicon and do it, the Rubicon electric mode, you can do that. And then there's regular hybrid where the computer decides which drivetrain, which power, you know, or what the drivetrain is powered by. And in this deal, Mark Allen opened up, you know, the designer for Jeep opened up the wheel wells. And they put a 33 on there and um, the interior is absolutely gorgeous. They did a bunch of, you know, little tweaks here and there, but to see a Grand Cherokee uh, set up for trail work, I think that um, that's a really underrated platform, especially on the new one. It'll be interesting to see if anybody figures out how to put a rooftop tent on it and, and some and outfits it because the old WK, there are a few enthusiasts out there. The WL uh, is a better wheeler than the WK ever was. So it uh, will be interesting to see there. And then finally, Magneto, having driven the first Magneto last year uh, and seeing what they've done with 2.0 with the 12-inch stretch and uh, Dana 60 and 80s or Dynatrack uh, 60s and 80s, 40 inch tires, um, still kept the manual transmission, but they took the uh, the trans that comes um, behind the 3.6 out and put a, uh, a Tremec in there. Um, so much power. Again, this is this is amazing. Uh, I think in the Jeep concepts, what they've done right, especially in 4xE, and with the electric for the Jeep crowd to get that acceptance, is they put everything downstream of the transfer case is identical to every other Jeep. And so it gives you an opportunity to experience the new technology, but le but for all intents and purposes, lift kits are the same. How you install shocks and springs, solid axles, all the things you love about the Jeep stay the same. I think that's a really brilliant uh, a way to approach a hardcore enthusiast base who might not be ready to make the move. And you're starting to see people slowly trickle in there because you're not taking away from what a Jeep is. And Magneto, while it's a one-off concept, exemplifies that way of thinking. So I think that's very cool. Well, we've been pleasantly surprised by the four by E sales that we've had on both skid plates and suspension systems, um, yeah. which has shown that just been there's been a steady stream. It's pretty cool. Now, what about that Grand Cherokee? What's the mileage on it? Is it any better than the Wrangler? So the Grand I'm Cherokee, sure. yeah. So the Grand Cherokee on pure EV is twenty five. I want to say the Wrangler's twenty or twenty one, something like that. So you get a little bit more, a little slip more slippery. Um, but the uh, the highway mileage obviously is is a lot better. I want to say it is. Uh, combined that's a couple miles per gallon i think better than the than the v6 because you're still it's still a turbo four right and then you're still hauling around the weight of the battery so it's not going to be you know a a massive leap it's 56 mpge for those of you who, who know what that is um and it's you know for my wife we've got a 21 wk2 we got the very last overland literally the last week that they made overlands we got one and uh she really wanted the new wl and I told her, I said, yeah, you know, your lease isn't up for a few years. Like, it'd be stupid for us to get out of it. And then all of a sudden, the secondary market went crazy on pricing. And all of a sudden, her car is worth $4,000 more than what the buy-off is on the lease. So then I'm like, well, that's a $4,000 down payment. Let's look into it. So start looking into it. I go on the drive, the media drive to drive the 4xE. It's quiet. It's powerful. It's, it's, it's incredibly uh, comfortable, adaptive, a lot of tech on it. 
and I started thinking, well, maybe this is, you know, she's like, I don't want a battery anything. Well, this is a hybrid. And I, I, I think hybrids are going to be really the way to go for the, for at least the midterm, right. Until battery technology catches up. But it's like, let's, let's lease a hybrid. Let's see how it is. Cause I, I installed a charging station at home because of all the new vehicles that I have to test for the magazine. So we already have that done. It'll charge in two hours to 25 miles and her commutes 11 miles each way. Oh. Well, 25 miles on electric only. So now you're talking about maybe filling up once a month, thousand mile range. A lot of Wrangler four by owners are saying I get a thousand miles to a tank of gas uh, if I'm plugging in every night. And all of a sudden you start looking, oh, there's the $7,500 federal rebate plus, you know, the discounts I get through my uh, my friendly neighborhood dealer. And it, the lease rate for a brand new upgrade to the new platform and everything is probably going to be about what we pay now. So we kind of, you know, we're like, all right, well, you know, as long as they're going to make it easy for us to take the credits and do that, we'll try a hybrid for the first time. So it'll be interesting to see how she likes it and what it's like living with one. But um, definitely really excited about the tech and and everything. Um, it's it's <laughs> It's a it's a really good vehicle. Everything that I've dealt with so far. That's cool. what's what's it's like. What it's like living with one. Yeah, yeah. Right. You're That's talking right. about the, you're talking about the Jeep, right? Yeah, it's an unknown. <laughs> yeah, the Jeep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very cool. That's very cool. So, in all the different concepts, now I think Bob was our favorite. You know, yeah. Of of the ones we saw, right? Um, I did notice there's a little bit of a trend in that open flare concept that they had going on it was on the magneto it's all yeah. on bob you know that, that that's pretty cool like that would be a nice little aftermarket accessory to to have you know you know the whole idea of mud flaps is gone then you just get stuff thrown up through there yeah right a little catch bag you know, let's just figure rocks. out how many ways we can throw rocks at ourselves self-inflicted mm-hmm. uh windshield cracks sure no problem just getting go up high right it's just it's high <laughs> yeah, high right arch. over the top yeah better aerodynamics though right so more airflow so right, over the exactly. over the years, just let's, let's go back to the last ten years. What is your favorite concept you've had, ever seen out there? Oh, it has to be the FC, the mighty FC. Yeah, um, that was the forward control. If you guys remember, it was at the yeah. Um It was that grandpa's first time. Yeah, built on a, a JK platform. That and the, and the new Kaiser was was awesome. That was the uh, M seven one five off the JK platform. Mm-hmm. Um, those are my two favorites. The the reason I think I gotta go Mighty FC is because driving it is the weirdest thing ever. Um, because you're on top of and ahead of the front axle, going mm-hmm. driving down hills, and there's a big giant weight plate that's in the back to keep the rear down. But it's the most unnerving, unnatural thing you could ever do. If you're doing like <laughs> Hell's Revenge in it, like you're sweating bullets and puckering, and, and it turns out it's fine. It's, it, you never have any issues. But you're so tall, so out in front. It looks like your toes are going to scrape on, you know, the next obstacle, the next ledge. It's it's absolutely weird. I don't know how unnerving is really the best ad- adjective for it because it will blow your mind how freaking weird that thing is to drive. So you know, it's funny. I hadn't to this point. I hadn't even thought about that. Right. I know you guys do the media days. You go out there and you stand yeah. around. You rewrite, drive around with them. But I hadn't even thought about the fact that all these cool rigs are actually getting wheeled. Right, yeah. you're getting a chance well, to sit in there. Doesn't every year. Like, like this year, they brought out a bunch of concepts, and Jim Morrison does a private ride for, uh, you know, a small group of uh, employees and people that he invites. And I've been lucky enough to go the last couple of years. And uh, I drive stick, so for me, you know, he asked me which concept I wanted to drive last year, and I drove Pork Chop, uh, which was a, a JK that was uh, cut a lot of weight out of it, and that was actually made in response to Four Wheelers Project Con Artist. Because Mark Allen drove con artists and went, this thing's a heavy pig. And the next year, Pork Chop came out with all the uh, the light weighting. <laughs> so Pork Chop and I kind of have a little bit of a history because the genesis of that came from a build I did. But it's also one of the few ones that are manuals. And so I drove that this year. And I took my uh, my 14-year-old with me. And she'd never been to Moab Easter Jeep Safari, never been on any trails. We did the first half of Poison Spider. Uh, we were climbing up the ledges and waterfalls and that thing, open top, open doors. Um you know, and, and she, and it was a three, eight, it's an older JK three, eight with a stick, which is not the best wheeling thing ever made. And she's like, we're going up that, like you should have seen, she had her like look of just absolute fear. It was awesome. And she's we were so proud of herself that she hung and was able to do it. That one from a heartstrings deal. Cause I shared it with my daughter and because of the Genesis of it, I do really love pork chop a lot. It's, it's a great build. But nice. yeah, to your point, Jeep uses these things. As soon as they're done doing show circuit, they go back out to Moab and people are driving them and they get used. And they're one of the few companies 
that will do a one-off, you know, half a million dollar plus prototype or concept vehicle and then hand the keys over for people to drive on a trail that's going to scratch them up. It's, it's really a, a beautiful thing. And it's really, that goes back to the DNA of Jeep. All right. So I have a bucket list item now. One of these days, I'm going to, we're going to be popular enough to actually be able to go on a, on a drive on one of these concept rigs. Well, so back in the day we took, uh, it was after SEMA and I was, I'm friends with Craig who was skunk works back then. And, yep. and took the FC up to Logandale and there was, there was a couple of other ones that we brought out. He brought out there. Um, but yeah, I remember going, wow. So you got to take these back and oh yeah, they're going to need to get fixed and, and, you know, uh, cleaned up so that it looked like they never ever were out at Logandale. <laughs> so, yeah, right. FC, when it was a blast. Yes. Uh, do you remember one of the very first years they did a concept, there was a orange JK and it had a roll bar that was done like a CJ5 and had a Viper steering wheel. Yep. Um, I can't remember what the engine was on that, but Craig and I were on the water, the little waterfall ledge over by the sand dunes on the trail. It's closed now, but back then it was it was open. And um, I did a front wheel stand on it because the shifter and the calibration was off and the brakes and scared the crap out of him and we did almost a vertical wheel stand and i stabbed it and throttle was a little bit late so we kind of hung there for a second then drove through it and for the longest time he gave me so much crap about, i thought you knew how to drive off road <laughs> i'm like oh, man it's the calibration on your jeep no it's not that well you should have not been there so craig used to give me a lot of crap for a long time about that but i think i truly scared him because that was the first year i think they ever Brought concept, so all that sweat equity is he's looking out the front windshield at it, going, "Uh oh." Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Drive with me more after the last Moab incident. Oh, it's all good. Oh, incident. It's all good. Oh, I about lost it, but again, my JK stuttered a minute, and I throttled it out. And we, I thought we were going over. We didn't. It worked out. <laughs> yeah, I got a good picture of Project Connors on Hell's Gate vertical wheel stand, and yeah. Shank that too. That was, that was a manual and. Uh, Shank Saad for Bill Stein was in it with me, and he, uh, we got an in-car camera video of it, and then it just, you hear the flares, and you hear the, like each cylinder turning, and the, the uh, crank trying desperately to keep spinning, and it's like <laughs> every piston firing, and we barely saved it, but we saved it. I was thinking, oh, this is how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> no. a company vehicle. Yep. Yep. Uh, it'd be so much fun. Well, then again, the whole idea of wheeling out there is fun. I mean, it's just, it's, that's why I'm, I'm hoping, and I always say I'm hoping, I mean, Corey knows I, I hope more than actually happens to, to do Moab this year, uh, during our modern Jeeper adventure, uh, during Memorial weekend. What do you have planned for that, Corey? I'm not going to tell. Oh, geez. <laughs> damn it. it. I got to find out by coming out. Yeah, well, see, what happens is if I if I tell people where we're going to be, then we end up running into all kinds of people out there hanging out on the trails, and yeah, and which is why we don't tell people about UA because right? we don't yeah. want booby traps or people to come out and join us, and you know we've got permits and we don't can't mix it with people. So yeah, we, I totally get that. Yeah, so and it's, it's I mean typically Memorial Day weekend is a little it's, it's quieter. There's a lot of mountain bikers and yeah. stuff in town. Um, but, um, and it also depends on our group. You know, we have a lot of flexibility in Moab and if we get a group and, and we end up with a group that's maybe either not as experienced or a group that wants to just go do crazy rock crawling stuff, we can kind of make those calls on the fly, but yeah, it's going to be, it should be fun. It, I, Moab is, is, you know, it's kind of my backyard. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to Memorial day. It's hard to go during Easter Jeep Safari and people that never go to Moab or haven't been, they always want to go out and wheel during Easter Jeep Safari. And I tell them, you want to go wheel, don't go during that week because it's yeah. such a crazy mess. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's just, well, just like, you know, guys want to do the Rubicon and they choose Jeepers Jamboree. I mean, this is the 70th right. anniversary this year. It is absolutely sold out. It will be a long, long day going to wheel yes. in on, on Jeepers Jamboree on that Thursday. And it is, but that's it. That's part of the game, right? You get to go in right. and deal with all those people. But yep. you either want to do it for that embracing of being in a line of amazing Jeepers and out there having fun with each other, or you're just trying to get in. If you're trying yep. to get into the springs, you go in early, you go in late, you try to avoid the, those lines. But it's the same thing. Now, uh, let's talk a little about your history because we always like to, our listeners always like to know about things like what was your very first Jeep? Oh, so my very first Jeep was actually, um, 
I, I mean, you could look at it a couple different ways, but it would probably be my uh, my 12 JK, to be honest. I was really? a long wheelbase guy and a pickup truck guy, and then when I got the four-wheeler, I was always driving our company vehicles, so I didn't need, you know, at the time, didn't feel the need to uh, to have it. We had Teal J, which turned into the Teal Brute, and, mm-hmm. and all sorts of, cons- or all sorts of uh, project vehicles and stuff. Uh, I always drove pickup trucks because I always liked the longer wheelbase. So when the four door came um, and, you know, the unlimited and I had a family, it suddenly became the perfect uh, Jeep for me. And so um, I've always loved Jeeps. Uh, the LJ was the first one that really, you know, new Jeep that grabbed me where I was like, wow, I could see myself doing this. XJs were something my buddies had, but they were, they were too small for me. I still liked having wheelbase. And then when I got the four wheeler and really got exposed and, and, just have really loved the brand. Now, the first Jeep I ever drove would be my old GPW, which is technically a Ford that's sitting in the garage. So when I was, uh, I don't know, 15 years old or so, I was at my uncle's ranch and graduated from the three-wheeled uh, balloon tire of death ATV. And uh, <laughs> yes. he tossed me the keys to the GPW, and he had gotten a, a like a Kubota to run around the ranch and said, hey, you can go drive this thing. And that was his. He's had that thing since 1970. I took it from him uh, this past year. Um, and it was always at the ranch, it's always his ranch vehicle. And so that's where I cut my teeth off-roading. That's where I had my first real experience, um, yes. and drove it all over. So to have that vehicle in my possession now, uh, but I got to convert it from ranch hand to a uh, ra- ranch hand, as I like to call it, into, uh, something, uh, a little bit more usable for Moab. It is cool though, because a lot of stuff was done in the seventies. So it certainly has a seventies vibe. It's got a, uh, 66 Buick, a 225 odd fire V6 in it. It's got wow. an updated transfer case. It's got the military style T90 with the military cane on mm-hmm. the uh, trans. It's got a um, original worn overdrive, and it has an original worn 8274 on the bumper that was nice. built. I checked with Warren. The date code shows it was built in April of 1977. It was purchased in 1978, which is when I was born. So the winch is as old as I am. The winch is actually older than I am. And it is still on the vehicle it was purchased for. And I have the original receipt, $466, I believe, is what it cost. Oh, wow. 1978. And wow. so I talked to Andy at Warren about doing a rebuild with it with some modern stuff. And he's all on board. So hopefully Four Wheeler will be able to take that thing apart and put the modern components on it and the old cool. case. Um, and then it's got, if you guys are familiar with the older solid axles, you know, hubs were a big deal back then. So they had, you know, Selectomatics and, you know, all that kind of stuff and worn premium hubs and they had dual matic. So I have the dual matic and it's two levers that come out and rotate 180 degrees to lock in the hubs. But those levers, I think they're made out of aluminum and they bend really easy. And they're really, they just, they're super finicky. So I looked on eBay and you can buy those things for like 250 bucks for a pair of use, like roached. And I was like, all right, let me see uh, if I can find some worn hubs because I wanted all worn to match. You would not believe this for less than the price of what I could sell those dual Maddox for on eBay, I found the exact same part number of the worn hubs that are legit to the late seventies when all the other worn stuff was put on oh. at, by two different buyers. One was in Washington and one was in Pennsylvania at the exact same time. I bought both of those up right away. So I'll be swapping out the dual Maddox for the worn. So I'll have worn all the way around on it. So that's awesome. You know, this is pretty cool. It's got these old buckets out of a, a Triumph. So those are all roach. So taking those out, I got some new buckets for it that kind of match the style of the low back bomber bucket. Found a new old stock 3B windshield. So 3B is a high hood flat fender, which had the overhead valve engine. When you put a 3B windshield on a, on a regular uh, low hood flat fender, it gives you that chopped look. So had that uh, windshield frame is on there and then had a buddy of mine build a new roll bar to match so it's cj5 style and the cool thing about the gpws and the early mbs are there's toolboxes in the rear corner but when you put a, a a cage or roll bar back there you can never open the boxes fully and i've got a rear seat on mine so what's awesome is my buddy figured out how to put in that roll bar to where i can still open the toolboxes in the corners fully and the rear seat's usable so it's uh, slow slow progress but uh it should be uh, it should be a, a pretty cool trail machine when I'm done. For sure. Well, you're definitely a project guy, and I'm sure that comes with the territory. You have to do projects not only on one side for the articles you're writing, but as everything you do, like when you're doing this this build here, are you documenting and saying, hey, this is a potential article down the road? 
Yeah, I mean, some of them start out as articles. We've got a lot of people, you know, you follow my Instagram and they'll see what I'm working on and they'll be like, hey, you know, we've got something for this. Or uh, even my friends at Metal Cloak, I was looking for a belly pants skid plate on uh, on my Jeep after destroying my stock one in Moab uh, a year or a couple of years ago. And Scott Becker called me up and he says, you know, I have what you need, right? And I was like, oh, yeah. He goes, let's get you Metal Cloak on there. And I've had it on there for about a year. And it's been amazing to be able to slide over stuff and, and whatnot. So sometimes some some people or friends in the industry will see what I'm working on and say, hey, we've got the perfect thing if you need something. Um, sometimes even parts I'm just going to go out and get on my own. I always document it for Instagram anyway, just because it's sort of like a living diary of what you're doing to the car. But I've always, yeah, taken enough pictures where I can turn it into an article. Because I've had it before where I wasn't going to do an article. And then maybe somebody saw on Instagram, like, I'm trying to do the same thing. I'd love to see how you did it. And you're like, all right, I'll write something. So you can never truly get away from writing content. I just, I don't, I don't know. I feel like anything I do isn't fully complete until I can tell the story of why I did it or how I did it. What, when you're writing these articles, what is the future of media that you see it? I mean, there's this, this idea that there will always be magazines and many of those magazines will be like, uh, you know, the, the, the coffee table. Yeah, type bespoke. Mags, bespoke magazines um the idea of the petersons of the world and the four wheelers of the world is just kind of fading away um or is it that you're writing for digital content i mean how do you think these days when you're writing content well i i tend to think platform agnostic so there's certain things you have to write for digital like seo and stuff like that and optimize them uh you write a little bit different style for print Four wheeler print just uh you know we're hanging on just had our 60th anniversary we're the oldest and first of all the four by four magazines and we're still around i think there's a lot of value to it i think that it's it still serves a need in the marketplace um but yeah i think that the hard thing is you have so many people out there that can self-publish now that are self-professed experts that don't have the expertise don't have the connections like even if i don't know anything which is a lot of stuff i know the right guys to go to to learn those things a lot of these influencer guys just go out there and just start talking and are, you know, it's they're they're factually wrong on things. And um, it's hard to come from a place in journalism where you have to have a background. There are some ethics. There are rules of the road. There are uh, guardrails to, to somebody who can say whatever he wants, whether he's being entertaining and is doing you know jackassery for the uh, for the clicks or wants to be seen as an expert, even though they don't know what they're talking about and then tells people the wrong thing. You know, we try and take the the path in the middle. And again, I, I, I try and write and do everything we can, videos, all that stuff to go wherever it needs to go. Because at some point, people are going to get tired of seeing a screen in front of their faces. And a lot of people, you know, whether it's on an airplane or, you know, having your morning constitutional, some people like to grab a magazine and just like, tear, you know, going through the pages. So I think there's always going to be a place for magazines. I wouldn't be surprised if the kids today are sick and tired of screens and go back to magazines it's just a matter of who will still be standing when they make that pivot um but um i just want to write content and be able to place it wherever the audience happens to enjoy engaging with that content and when you write content is it is it placed i mean you're doing a you're doing an article and that same article and the same content will appear digital it'll appear on the in yeah. print wherever you can get it everything i write now everything my team writes now goes online at motortrend.com slash four wheeler or slash truck trend uh because we have a new unified site um and then every one of those stories gets socialized out and then a brew baker who's still running four wheeler print will pick the cream of the crop for what he thinks are the best stories and pull those and then um, modify them or optimize them for print get it and that's interesting because it is much easier to print and publish. And so you get a lot more content out there on the digital side, but yep. you have to be a lot more selective on what you put into print. Yep. And, and it's funny, we've done a ton of research and there's not crossover between those markets. People like print, like print, and people like digital, like digital. So, you know, some people say, well, you put it out and then there's no reason to buy the magazine because the story's already out. Well, the story's going to be a little bit different in the print side anyway, but the crossover is minuscule. I mean, we're talking about single digit percentage points. And so they really are two different products for, for two different audiences. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, I'm still a paper guy. I like to hold a magazine and sit there and, and read through it and, and hang out with it and put it in the rack next to the porcelain bus, you know, just yep. <laughs> that's, that's when I get a chance to read, especially in my household. Um, well, that's awesome. So, you know, you're, what do you see the future like 
for you where are you going next what's uh, what's on your horizon both the trips events and otherwise in your schedule yeah so uh i've got coming up uh olaf uh this weekend out at the mdhca at goffs uh, we're doing an event out there i've got uh, overland expo west coming up uh we've got a few magazine events coming up i'm starting to do the pre-running and planning for our overland adventure uh, 22 coming up in September, October timeframe. Uh, Christian starting to work on Overland Adventure. Uh, we've got a lot of side projects, that kind of stuff. And as far as me, um, I don't see, you know, a lot of people are moving around in the industry. I, I don't see myself moving anytime soon unless there's some crazy good, uh, interesting offer that I'm not the type of person that can do the same thing every day. And this job has blessed me with being able to, every day is different than the last. I never know what I'm going to be doing and it's fun. And I get to you have a taste of a little bit of everything in the role that I have. And so unless I can find something that would allow me to have that kind of flexibility still, I, I don't see myself leaving anytime soon. And, you know, if uh, who knows what the future holds, but, you know, I, at this point I plan on being the guy that turns the lights off at the end of the day, if, uh, if it's all done at some point. That's very cool. Hey, by the way, when you're out at Overland Expo West, uh, we are using that. We're actually going to be out there. Corey and Jesse are going to be out there. Myself and Mike are going to be out there because we're doing this uh, final part of our Rocklander, the ultimate Rocklander 20K giveaway, awesome. which is now a 30K giveaway. Um, we'll be doing that live from Overland Expo West, um, doing the giveaway and uh, and choosing our winner. So that'll be fun. Still working out details. And we'll, of course, share it with all of you listeners when we have the details in place. But that should be a fun one. But, Sean, come out and join us uh, on, quote, unquote, stage, because I don't know what our stage is going to be. It might be, <laughs> the, might be sitting in the back of, of Corey's truck. Um, <laughs> I like it. We're all just going to be sitting on uh, lawn chairs with a little, little fire pit in the truck. There you go. Yeah. We're, we're overlanding. That's yeah, it. Perfect. That's how we overland. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, that's awesome. Hey, Corey, anything uh, you want to uh, ask our guest or before we wrap up? This has been awesome. No, I think we're, uh, I mean, it's, it's always, it's always cool. And, and uh, Sean's such a, I mean, you've done so many things. Um, it's, and again, it's, so many people don't know that there's people behind making a lot of these things happen in the industry. And, and you've always been one of those guys. So, uh, you know, thanks for, thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule and, and hanging out with us for a bit. Yeah. We'd love to uh, maybe get on the trail with you guys at some point, but uh, thanks for inviting me and happy to come on anytime. I, you know, obviously love off-roading, love Jeeps and on all this stuff. So it's, uh, to me, this is this is a, a nice again. I get to do a little bit of everything. This is a nice break from the regular grind to just chit chat and talk about uh, off roading jeeps a little bit. Well, cool. you're always welcome to any one of our um, modern jeeper adventures. Um, you know, we got uh, between Moab, we got Tillamook coming up, and that's always a popular one. Um, I don't know if you have wheeled out there before. That's uh, that's that's an awesome place, to, and it's truly, truly a relaxing. It's probably our most relaxing event, in my opinion. And of course, uh, Corey has you know being what he is right in his backyard with all the amazing trails up there and the the Colorado Adventure, which is what September is that what that's scheduled for? Yeah, September. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you are always welcome. If you happen to look at your schedule and look at ours and they match up, uh, just tell us. We'll get you there. Yeah. All, all right. right, love it, love it. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, Modern Jeepers, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Sean, thank you for being a part of this. It's been great. I know we've been talking about this for a while, and we could keep talking and talking and talking, but like we all have, all have these schedules, and I think Corey and Jesse, I'm starting to see sweat drip down from the, <laughs> the forehead uh, out there in Texas. So, um, again, Modern Jeepers, thank you for joining us, and you know how to reach us. You can reach me at matson at medicalclick.com and Corey at medicalclick.com and jesse at medicalclick.com and, of course, modernjeeperadventures.com, modernjeeperform.com, modernjeeper.com. We're all over the place. Sean, how can they find you? Yeah, if you want to uh, find me, you can uh, search for my name, Sean Holman, uh, on the Google, find all my articles on Motor Trend. Find my uh, my personal Instagram is at Sean P. Holman or uh, Truck Show Podcast at Truck Show Podcast. Find us on Facebook and Instagram, all those places, and uh, love interacting with our, our listeners or if, uh, you know, tons of people hit me up with questions uh, on Vice, and I answer them as quickly as I can. So feel free to drop me a note if uh, there's something you think I could help you with or point you in the right direction. Hey, hey Sean, do, do you guys still do, and I don't see this that often, but like just featured rigs, like, you know, yeah. fan rigs, reader rigs, that sort of thing? Yeah, 100%. So we, I think... Uh, Vernon Jared shot about seven or eight of them out of Moab. We shot a bunch at King of Hammers. So, you know, try and do those uh, whenever we can because that's still one of those things online uh, that that pulls a lot of pay, a lot of eyeballs and page views because people want to see how other people are building their rigs. 
Excellent. So if you guys have rigs and you have something you think is worth, uh, worth Sean's time, uh, send him a message. All right, Modern Jeepers, thank you again for joining us. And you guys out there, we'll see you on the trails. Cheers. See ya. See you guys.